So uh, I'm rather astonished at the coherence of the themes that we've been hearing today, how closely they align with I, what I have in mind when I think about seeing the world whole. You see, this image was new in human history just a short few years ago. I was a little boy, about 10 years old. I was living in Taiwan when this photograph first kind of burst you know, into the consciousness of the world. And I hung it on my bedroom wall. And it really drives home the point. It's the Imago Mundi. It's the image of the world. It's literally now how we can see ourselves in one perspective. And I believe that we've come to an, a, a turning point in human affairs, in human history, that all the forces of history have brought us to a point where the next logical stage in our socio-cultural evolution is to see one another as the members of one family. I have a friend who lives down the road here. He was out in Glacier National Park on vacation a few months ago. And he said, you know, I was driving along, and we got out, and we were looking at some trees, a beautiful view. And the ranger sidled up to us, and he said, you see those trees? It looks like that forest is made of thousands of individual trees just spread across these mountainsides. And he says, but in actuality, that's a common rhizome. These are quaking aspens. It's one of the largest biological organisms on the planet. Some of these are almost 10,000 years old. And each tree extends from the one common rhizome, lending this forest an incredible resilience. There are plants in the southwest in the desert that operate in a similar way. And the reality of those trees, of the quaking aspens, is if there's a microclimate at one edge of the forest and it's drought-like and those trees begin to wither, the trees at the opposite end of the forest send the moisture. They send water to those trees. The entire forest can be burned down in a forest fire and it spontaneously regenerates itself. The resilience of that forest is integrally related to the oneness of it as a kind of a super organism. And I think that this is what we've got, this is where we've got to get to in our imaginations in our, and in our minds, right? Throughout human history, we started with the assumption that we are at the center of our world, and those people out on the margins, out on the periphery, are someone else. They're strangers, they're rivals, they're competitors. Whoever they are, they're not us. And so we gradually, you know, overcome much of this. Even in my lifetime, in the short time I've been on the planet, we're at a very different place today from where we are. And you can hear it in, you know, what the speakers have been saying to us today about this fundamental transition. Well, that's one aspect of seeing the world whole, is not, seeing, not regarding anyone as a stranger, but understanding that resilience is going to come not because we are you know, engaged in a power struggle for dominance, for hierarchy, for survival, some dark dystopian nightmare version of the future, but that we're going to get through what the novelist and social critic James Howard Kunstler, don't go Google him and think that I think everything that he thinks, because he has a darker view of the future by far than I do, but he coined the, the phrase, the long emergency. So I want to appropriate it, because it's highly descriptive. That's where we're entering into right now, right? Our, our, because of global warming, because we cease to regard the Earth as a living thing somewhere along the line. Maybe we took a wrong turn back in the Enlightenment. I don't know. But we tend to see our planet too often as our property, and we're free to assault it, to extract its resources in the most brutal manner possible, to spread toxic ways to do clear cutting, to scrape the bottom of the sea and destroy you know, entire ecosystems, to really use this planet, this beautiful blue marble, as if it were our ATM. We're just going to extract resources and not give much thought to the idea that it is a living thing. That's the other aspect of seeing the world whole. And by that, I don't mean some kind of you know, mystical neo-paganism. I mean, it's a living thing like a tomato plant in your backyard, like your cat who hops up in your lap. It's alive. The systems of the Earth you know, have limitations on, on how much abuse that they can absorb. So we're driving our planet with a kind of heedlessness far from equilibrium, and we're starting to pay the price. Um, I know that there are people in the world who don't accept the idea of global warming. They simply haven't really looked at the science. You can go online, the inter 
Governmental Panel for Climate Change has just released in the last few weeks the uh, summary for policymakers of AR5, the fifth assessment. They've been doing it every six years. Just read the little boxes. Uh, the journal uh, Environmental Research Letters in 2013 did a sedulous analysis of peer-reviewed journals in climate science. They looked at almost 9,000 journals. Their conclusion was uh, that the consensus around anthropogenic global warming was such that the level of uh, dissent within that community was vanishingly small, less than one half of 1%. Now again, seeing the world whole means seeing with the eye of justice. And justice to me implies that we're tuned in to reality even when, and this is where justice helps us sharpen and clarify our vision, even when to do so undercuts our own advantage. Right? I accept the reality and the truth of a proposition because it's true. We live in a time when there's kind of systematic distortion of reality. So we have to learn to think with our own minds and see with our own eyes if we're going to make progress. We live in a country, you and I, that values freedom greatly. And among those freedoms ought to be the right to ask fundamental questions about the nature of the good society, about the path that we're on and where it leads to look down the road and ask ourselves, how are we going to get out from this place? And I think that this is where you and I have got to ask our, ourselves some serious and fundamental questions about how we portray reality around us and how we think about who we are. Now, you know, for a long time, since I was a little kid, Paul Ehrlich, these folks have talked about the problem of a rising population. And by the way, when I was born, there were 3 billion people on the planet. We just crossed the threshold of 7.2 billion, so it's more than doubled. We're on our way to 9.5 or 10, upper bound, lower bound, at, at mid-century, which will be the peak of human population, and then we start cat coming down the other side. Birth rates are falling all over the world as women become educated and empowered and enjoy different options. So, you know, the problem then is pretty obvious, right? If we've outrun some of the capacity of our planet to absorb waste and to supply us with resources and that kind of thing, it's those people who have high levels of fertility. And most of them live in the global south, right? These are places where women don't have a lot of education. And so it's easy to say, well, they're the problem. I think there are two issues that we have to remember when we talk like that. Number one, human beings are never the problem. These are human beings. To assign responsibility for our problems to the number of people is just fundamentally wrong. Think about real estate. The most valuable real estate on the planet is in places like Manhattan and Tokyo because the range of opportunities that emerge, the sense of discovery and possibility when we're close together, you know, in large numbers, just mushroom. People aren't the issue. It's the consumer society. It's that we have defined ourselves as a bundle of appetites. And the purpose of our life on Earth is to satisfy every one of those appetites. Right? That's who we think we are. The problem is twofold. Number one, just by simply extending that model to increasingly larger numbers of people, we will create havoc very, very quickly. We're already seeing this as the Chinese began to follow in our footsteps and people in India and other places. So we could cap the increase in population tomorrow. And as long as we extend the consumer model you know, to larger and larger numbers of people, which is sort of what drives our economy, growth. Uh, it was the economist um, Kenneth Boulding. At one point in his career was very you know, prominent in his field. He was the president of the Professional Association of Economists. He says, any man who believes that geometric growth can continue indefinitely within the context of a finite system is either a madman or an economist, right? So the recognition of limits is not some kind of failure on our part. It's a recognition of reality. We have to work within these natural constraints to sort of heal the planet and that sort of thing. Okay, 
the second fundamental place where the ground must be cleared is we have to get away from this dark, pessimistic reading of human nature that we are incorrigibly conflictual and, you know, locked in ceaseless series of contests with each other. All of the institutions of human society, the judicial system, systems of governance, economic systems, finance, it's all predicated on this idea that in order to get what we, you know, to get ahead, we have to be locked in a hierarchical struggle for dominance. Where do we go if we leave that distorting model behind, which is pretty new in human history? People haven't thought of themselves in terms of an intense competitive individualism for very long. I mean, really, uh, at the outset of the Enlightenment, where that model began to sort of emerge, you're talking about a time there were fewer than a billion people, petroleum hadn't been discovered, there hadn't yet been an industrial revolution. It was a very different context. And we're still trying to ride that horse into the long emergency, and it simply will not work. And so there are three paths that are possible for us as we move into the future. One is to organize our conceptions around that conflictual model. And what that leads to is dystopian scenarios. We look at our prospects going forward, and we say, well, it's going to be, you know, a fight for declining amount of resources, peak oil and so forth. Um, and we're going to be locked in struggle with other civilizations, with other countries, with other classes, with other people, with other races, with other religions. From here on out, it's going to be about fighting. And we all know people who are sort of preparing for that kind of scenario, right? They're sort of arming themselves and sort of stockpiling things, and they're looking at civil disorder and so forth. There was a sociologist who actually examined what people typically do when they're civil disorder and disasters. She wrote a book called A Paradise Built in Hell. True enough, in a place like New Orleans, Katrina, the first narrative to emerge was one about conflict, you know? It was one about human beings behaving in bestial ways. But the second narrative was about the tremendous outpouring of altruism, guys who drove hours and hours and sacrificed sleep for days. They got in their boats, their fishing boats, and they went and they pulled people off of rooftops and saved them from drowning. That's what happens during a crisis. Humanity reveals itself in its true aspect, which is our higher nature is organized around the virtues, around justice, the capacity for service to the common good the capacity for compassion, for love, for a spirit of not competition, but mutualism. If we think like those quaking aspen trees, you know, we, it would, it's no good to have one of my arms hyper-developed like Popeye while the other one withers over here. The inequality, which is a phenomenon of our times, which is unprecedented in human history. A few weeks ago, you probably saw this in the news, um, Oxfam, ahead of the economic forum in Davos, Switzerland, released a report and they pointed out that 85 individuals currently control as much wealth as half the human population. So the poorest 3.6 billion on one side of the scale and 85 on the other. This is an unsustainable situation. And it's important to acknowledge that the people who have done that, many of them have walked a path that you and I tell ourselves we would like to walk. They're not, I don't think that they're bad people. They've done what has been sort of kneaded into the clay of their being from earliest childhood. I mean, that's kind of what we tell ourselves is the goal of life. And we have options. There's a different form of power which is available to us, which we can tap into. And so we see it already emerge around us. The movement for social justice, the movement for environmental sustainability is taking root in the form of the local food movement, for example, which respects the integrity and the wholeness of natural systems, understands that if we're gonna produce food for people, it should be life-giving, it should be healthy, it should be nutritive, it should be you know, something you would wanna to feed to your child. It recognizes that agriculture is intricately related to human communities. 
I, I want to give you one more example around food because it's so important. Food is at the basis of every human community. We've created a system, remember, about the importance of seeing reality as it is, not through distorting lenses. Here's an example. We've created a system of industrial food production, which is one of the wonders of the world in terms of the number of calories that it produces. 70% of all the food that's consumed in this country is processed. By processed, I don't just mean they tweaked it a little bit. It's been deconstructed. And it's been kind of cobbled back together through elaborate processes. In many cases, it's been denatured. Now, it's only since the end of World War II that we started to see these problems emerge in our country of obesity, of diabetes, of all of the chronic diseases of civilization, which have become such a threat to us, this obesogenic environment that we've created, that it's on the radar screen of the American military, right? We cannot count on being able to recruit enough young men who are physically fit, sufficiently fit, that they can get through boot camp and come out the other end of the pipeline and be ready to go. It's actually a threat at that level. Now, I hope the military transitions and we can repurpose some of that energy and some of that tremendous wealth and that know-how you know, to, to, to coping with the long emergency, reaching out to people. But the point is, we profess not to know what the underlying cause is. And now if we think globally, well, people come to this country from other places, from other uh, cultures where they eat whole foods, any diet we can survive on, everything from cow's blood to pure vegetarian diets, anything, all over the planet, throughout history, we've always managed to create diets that if the food was sufficient in quantity, we, we did okay. But what happens here is people enjoy something called the immigrant advantage, or sometimes it's known as the Hispanic paradox. They come from traditional cultures, eating traditional foods, they outlive us, they have better health outcomes, they resist the diseases of civilization, and then the second generation, it all, it all regresses back to the level where we're at. Traditionally, in global public health, people who lived in the global south and in the tropics, that's where the burden of disease was primarily infectious diseases, right? Now that the industrial food system is being spread all over the world, the diseases of civilization are coming there too. The diabetes, the inflammatory diseases, all of these things. So it's kind of like, shouldn't the purpose of our food system be to provide food that nurtures us and sustains us? So now that we become so sick, what happens? We have a healthcare system and a pharmaceutical system which kind of rushes in to try and address the problem. So instead of looking at the root causes, what's going on? We have a food system, a pharmaceutical system, a healthcare uh, system, which are all about generating huge amounts of profits for people, and they only engage in addressing the need for healthful food and that sort of thing as a secondary goal. We can no longer continue to operate in that way. These abstract systems, which are divorced from human values, which are divorced from the virtues, from considerations of justice, from care of the planet, from looking after the well-being of people, from the spirit of service to the common good. It creates these distortions. It creates the conditions of kind of chaos. We, I was in the Navy. The, you know, Buckminster Fuller said, planet Earth has no passengers. Everyone is crew. Well, we used to go to general quarters all the time. I lived on an old ship, used to catch on fire a lot. So in the middle of the night, we'd have to go to man our battle stations, just like in the movies. And I'm here to tell you, if we have to begin to sort of really focus on mitigation strategies, adaptation strategies, helping each other out, absorbing populations, there may be 150 million people, climate refugees, are going to have to seek new places to live, mostly around the Bay of Bengal, uh, places like Pakistan and and Myanmar 
and those sorts of places will be the most heavily impacted on Earth, but also from the low-lying Pacific Islands. Are we going to welcome them? Because guess what? We created the problem. The generation, the buildup of CO2 gas over many, many years is disproportionately something that we did. So the conversation in the Global South is about having us step in in the spirit of justice. India can't absorb them. Where are they going to go? So the question is, if we look at the world in wholeness, if we look through the eye of justice, if we see that the earth is actually a living thing and that we have a responsibility not only to look after the welfare of the planet, but the people with whom we're connected to, then there's power in that. There's power to change the world. The power that we need is not in Washington. It's not on Wall Street. It's not in some faraway place. We have to regenerate the structures of human society. We have to imagine ourselves in a mode of service, service to the common good, service to our fellow human beings, stewards of the earth, but also moving with the integrative forces of the time that we live in. And if we do this, if we align ourselves with those creative and integrative forces, then eventually the, we will make of this world another world. It won't be the world that we have, but it may well be the world that we want. Thank you.